Today, Enjoy My Life, 1984 by George Orwell. It was a bright and cold April day when Sin Smith, a 39-year-old man, entered the houses of victory. The smell of dining flooded the place. He barely climbed the seven floors that led him to his house. On each landing, there was a very light color poster with the huge face of a man with a big mustache and hard features. At the bottom was written Big Brother Watches Over You. This poster was also in every street. Winston looked at the city from the window. London was cold and sad. It was part of the Area 1 strip, a province of Oceania, the territory dominated by the party. Order was kept thanks to the patrols and the thought police. We listened to you and watched you through the telescreens. That way they controlled your thinking. Winston worked in the Ministry of Truth and you speak the official language of Oceania. It was called Minitru. It was responsible for what would be understood as culture and education. On its lustrous facade, it read, War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Once at home, Winston took a sip of Geneva that made him feel a little better. Then out of a drawer, he took out a book of white covers and a red spine. He hid in a place where the coward could not see him. If they found him writing, he would be sentenced to death or forced labor. Despite this, he began writing in his diary. First, he summed up a terribly bloody movie they forced him to watch. Then he was inspired to write about what happened to him that morning. He was in the Ministry of Truth, prepared for the two minutes of hatred they perform every day. While waiting for them to begin, O'Brien appeared, a big but nice member of the party, and a young, attractive brunette. Both had interest in Winston. One seemed intelligent and friendly, and the other dangerous. The two minutes of hatred began, which consisted of the face of Goldstein, the enemy of the people. He had been part of the party, but he fled, betraying them and creating the Brotherhood. He was part of the Eurasian rebels. His speech caused attendees to shout angrily, as if they were out of their mind. Later, the speech merged with the possible face of Big Brother. At that moment, the people relaxed, as if asleep, chanting GH. Winston was horrified, but he couldn't slip away. I looked around like the rest, Winston's as met O'Brien's, and both seemed to understand each other. Does a brother actually exist? He left the thought and returned to his room. He realized that he had been writing under the Big Brother. He was committing a thought crime. Criminals are punished with vaporization. That is death and disappearance. Still, he felt freer than ever. Winston's thoughts were interrupted by a knock on the door. He quickly struggled to keep his blank expression and rose to open it. It was the lady preferably called Parsons. She needed help with the drain. After fixing it, Winston ran into her aggressive children, totally blinded by violence. <laughs> Despite their young age, they scared Winston. That night, Winston dreamed of the death of his parents and sister during one of the first purges. Then he kept dreaming of the young brunette. She was removing her clothes, something unusual since they belonged to the anti-sex league. The way she stripped off his ideals fascinated Winston. The next day, after waking up with a loud whistle and doing four sports in front of the telescreen, he went to the Ministry of Truth. There he would recreate articles from the past so that they would correspond with the present. In the cafeteria, Winston met with Sim, a philosopher specializing in their language. His main objective was to control the mind. Sim arrogantly defended the destruction of words and ancient literature. Why Winston was nostalgic with the old language. He then realizes that the brunette girl was watching him intently. Abib tells them to return to work. Back at home, Winston writes in his diary about a bad experience he lived with a prostitute. The memory generates many uncomfortable feelings. He explained his relationship with his wife, Catherine. He didn't know if she was alive or dead. They had separated 10 years ago, being unable to produce children for the party for these his desire was a crime. So despite his wishes, Winston was never going to have a romantic relationship. Winston usually reflected on the power that could reach the pearls, 85% of the population. Unfortunately, the thought police controlled them. They were like a dumb mass. He finally came to the conclusion he had something to fight for. He felt he was writing the diary to fight the lie for Brian. Winston walked to the neighborhood of the Pearls. After unsuccessfully trying to get some information about the past from an old man, he went to the store where he bought his diary. He bought a coral stone. Going to those places and buying goods was very frowned upon. So when he left the store, his heart stopped when he came across the brunette girl. They both hid and Winston went home, terrified of the torture he would receive if someone discovered him. For days later, in the halls of the Ministry of Truth, Winston crossed paths with the young woman. She had a bandaged arm. When they were four meters from meeting, the girl stumbled and fell on the floor. 
letting the outcry fade. She looked at Winston with fear. He helped her up and they both continued on their way. She had slipped him a paper that read I love you. After that confession, they decided to meet in secret in the Victory Plaza. They found themselves in the middle of a large conglomeration. They spoke in whispers and agreed to see each other in a hidden place. She described a complex journey to meet. After a brief but intense handshake, they separated. When the day came, they met in one of the forests that surrounded the city. They were together for hours. Her name was Julia and she was 26 years old. They loved and wanted each other. From that day, they continued seeing each other, sometimes in the bell tower of a dilapidated church, others in the street pretending they didn't know each other. Once after the explosion of a nearby bomb, Winston kissed her again. Winston and Julie continued their meetings at the Carrington store. The old men turned a blind eye and they talked for hours. Julie carried products that Winston had not seen in years. Julie did not remember anything before the revolution, just what her grandfather told her. He disappeared when she was eight years old. Julia was rebellious with what affected her, but she did not intend to destroy the party and didn't believe in the Brotherhood. One day Winston realized that Sim had disappeared. He had ceased to exist. He had never existed. However, nobody stopped to think about it. Everyone organized the week of hate, the number of rocket bombs and deaths increased. Still, Julia and Winston were seeing each other. Their lives were better. One day it finally happened. Winston ran into O'Brien. With a serious and gentle courtesy, he invited him to go to his house to pick up a new edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. Winston agreed knowing that he was throwing himself into death, but he didn't care. In another meeting, Winston told Julia that he killed his mother and little sister, since they took away his food. One day he ran away with the chocolate tablet and when he came back there was no one at home. He never saw them again. Julia downplayed him. Winston said that the only ones with freedom are the pearls. But Julia reminded him that he was free in his thinking, even though the tower screens watched them. Julia and Winston went to O'Brien's house. Winston confessed all his concerns and his relationship with Julia. O'Brien's assistant, also an enemy of the party, appeared, and they toasted wine for Goldstein. O'Brien confirmed the existence of the Brotherhood, asked them a series of questions about how far they would be willing to go to fight the party. They were willing to do anything but separate. O'Brien informed them they would receive the Goldstein manuscript. Lastly, he explained the Brotherhood worked like this. They worked to help them, they confessed and killed them. Days later, Winston began to read the book with Julia in the Charrington store. They both watched a lady who hung the clothes. Upon seeing her, Winston felt that the pearls were the same ones and they were the dead ones. Julia repeated that, we are the dead. And in turn, a voice behind the wall repeated, you are the dead. Both brows, the voice told them to go to the center of the room and without touching each other to put their hands on their heads. The house was surrounded and they had to say goodbye, said the voice behind the frame. Suddenly many soldiers in black appeared and surrounded them. Then they threw away the paperweight and the small piece of coral rolled on the floor. They beat Julia and took her like a sack. Then Mr. Carrington appeared and the soldiers adopted a more submissive attitude. The seller had another aspect and attitude. He was an agent of thought. He always had been. Winston woke up with a cold light. He didn't know where he was. He just felt a strong pain in his stomach and hunger. They took prisoners in and out. He met the poet Ampleforth, arrested for having kept the word God in a poem. After he saw Parsons, her daughter had accused her. They all disappeared in horror. Suddenly, they put a brain next to a guard who hit Winston hard, making him faint. When he woke up, O'Brien was at his side along with a man in a white coat and syringe. Then they started questioning him. He confessed all the crimes of which he was accused, even though he had not committed them. The tortures were unspeakable. O'Brien was part of the party. He had lied to him and now wanted to raise his thoughts and then kill him. O'Brien wanted to show him their power by convincing him he held five fingers instead of four. That is why the doctor injected an explosion inside that caused a flash. When Winston regained consciousness, he felt that he was missing a part of his brain. O'Brien kept asking him questions that he could no longer answer. He had forgotten the past, but the effect did not last long. Though O'Brien allowed him to ask questions, Winston asked about Julia. O'Brien replied she betrayed him immediately and was no longer the girl he had met. She said the existence of Big Brother, but didn't confirm now the Brotherhood. Finally, and after much thought, Winston asked what's in room 101. O'Brien smiled and replied he should already know. The doctor then injected a liquid and Winston went into a deep sleep. Upon waking, O'Brien explained to Winston that there were three steps in his reintegration, learning, understanding, and acceptance. He was in the second, 
Then he gave a speech about what fueled the party. It was power for power and specifically power over men. Its main objective was to empty them. Winston refused to believe it. He trusted the spirit of humans. However, Brian played a recording in which he and Julie agreed to do horrible things for the Brotherhood. Then they released Winston from the stretcher. He hardly approached a mirror and discovered his body in horror. He had no hair or teeth, his nose was crooked and his eyes seemed to pop out. His knees were bigger than his thighs and his spine was deformed on his entire body. Winston burst into tears upon seeing himself. After this, Winston was changed to a better cell where they fed him and gave him hot water to clean himself. He was much better until one day he woke up screaming Julia's name. He still loved her. Minutes later, O'Brien was in the cell asking if he hated Big Brother. Winston answered yes. So they took him to room 101, where Winston had to face his greatest fear. They tied him completely to the chair and brought a box with hungry rats to his head. As soon as they let go, they would throw themselves on his head, tearing his eyes and tongue away. When they were about to release them, Winston sold that Julia. He didn't care what happened to her. Though they had him, Winston had set aside love and emptied himself. Since Winston left the Ministry of Love, he spent his days at the bar drinking Geneva and playing chess. Nobody approached him because they didn't want to risk being seen with him. One day he saw Julia, but everything had changed. She was not Julia, nor was he Winston, both admitted to having betrayed the other. Another day at the bar, Winston was expectant at the news of victory of defeat against Eurasia. When the telescreens claimed that Oceania had won, Winston was glad and felt some love and pride towards Big Brother. It finally happened. Winston walked the long hall and behind him was a guard. The shot with which he had dreamed so much in the cell finally pierced his head, but it didn't matter because he loved Big Brother. <laughs>